Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Convos with Kristen. There's always those moments where you're waiting for people to be able to get on, find their time. I know when you're moving from one meeting to a next in Zoom, sometimes they can run over a little bit and you just need that transition time a little bit. So we always like to give just a little bit of time. Um, I just literally, a couple minutes before we got on, was reading a quote that came into my email today from Simon Sinek, and it said, we know something is good when we're eager to share it. And it just felt so appropriate for this combos with Kristen because I am extremely eager to share about our community impact assessment and the conversation that we're going to be having today. So welcome to Convos with Kristen. It really just gives you an inside look into pretty much all things United Way of East Central Iowa, whether it's community collaborations or impact stories. What we do is we really look to just dive deep into how the dollars that you give to United Way is really making a difference in our community and really how then that is translating into supporting individuals individuals within Eastern Iowa so we can have strong communities because we know when we have strong communities, we have strong people and it creates all sorts of wonderful positive economic outcomes. So really Convos with Kristen started as a way to share not only the vital role that United Way plays in East Central Iowa, but like I said, to be able to showcase how the support that you give United Way is really making a difference and how it's being invested back into the community. And so each episode that we do, we invite special guests. They may be people from the community. They may be some of our own staff members. And we just really dig into conversations and have them explain to us in further detail and be able to give us more insight into different ways in which United Way is really helping connect within our community. So again, they could be nonprofit leaders, they could be business owners, they could be our own staff. And today we have a staff member joining us. So thank you for attending. Just, I hope you understand the gratitude that we have for the support that you give United Way along the way. And just a couple of Zoom things before we get started. Um, if you have questions or comments, please just drop them into the chat. You also have the ability to raise your hand and we can see that on the backside. And so we'll be able to call on you and then I think we'll be able to unmute you as well. But just wanting to let you know that you have the opportunity to ask a question. And it really does when you have questions, Put them in there because it does actually make the conversation just that much more robust. I've got my questions that I'm going to ask, but obviously I've been involved in this work and so I have some insights and you may think of something that I didn't think of. The other probably piece to let you know of, we budget an hour of time, so we have until 1230. However, we're not sticklers to sticking to the hour, and we just go with where the conversation takes us. We will be done by 1230 at the absolute latest, but if we finish up early, that's completely fine because that's where the conversation led. Okay, so we are going to talk about our community impact assessment. So many of you know that United Way is a funder that supports our community through three main areas health, education, and financial stability. We also are a community con convener and collaborator, and we bring individuals and organizations together to really strengthen our community and help fill those gaps of need. We believe that the best way to support our community is to know its present and critical needs. And so it's our duty to listen to Eastern Iowans and learn about how those needs impact their daily lives and find ways to support them. This is not what United Way thinks are the challenges within our community, but it truly is the voice of Eastern Iowans. So this really brings us to our main project and what a lot of our work focused on this past year in 2021, it's our community impact assessment. So we're talking about this today because really in order to create stronger communities, more equitable communities, we need to understand the challenges that are out there that our community is facing, and then how we can create those uh, united community solutions and being able to address them so everyone can thrive. So I'm going to invite my coworker, Carrie Chase on. She is our Director of Community Impact. Carrie, if you have the ability to get your, your video on. All right, um, there she is. Carrie has been at United Way for three years. She has been in her role about a year and a half, 
A uh, fun fact around Carrie is she was on the job about 60 days, maybe not even 45 days when the Drake show hit. And so Carrie was able to, this girl dug up or rolled up her sleeves and really dug in to be able to help with our community's response to the Drake show. Carrie, before she came to United Way, has worked uh, in direct service with a lot of different nonprofits in our community and knows the community pretty well. Um, another fun fact Carrie doesn't know that I'm going to throw out there about her is she has, uh, she's an animal lover. She has two dogs and a cat and she just got a brand new puppy. So welcome Carrie Chase. Well, thank you, Kristen. And I am lucky that today I'm not sporting the love marks that the puppy leaves on my face as she gives kisses and all those kind of great things. <laughs> <laughs> we love them. Okay, so talking about the community impact assessment, just tell us what you and your team worked on this past year. What was the process like? How did you come up with methods of gathering information? That type of stuff. Yeah, so I think Kristen kind of you nailed it on the head when you talked about we really wanted to hear what our community has to say. Um, we don't want to be the ones United Way doesn't want to be the ones telling we want investment we want um, we want people to join the process. And so really for us, it was one thing we really needed to understand the critical needs that are in our community. And we do know that the last two years have brought a lot of compounded issues and problems to our community with pandemic and then with derecho. And so it really felt like the timing was right to dig deep and really understand. And not just the the top level, but really start to dig into what are some of those systemic barriers and issues that continue to perpetuate the kind of the cycle that we have um, with, with just trying to better ourselves as a community. So what we did was um, we did kind of a three-tiered approach to this. We did a really huge analysis of our data. So we have a lot of we have access to census data. Most people obviously do. There's education um, data um, through the state. There's other, there's other sources that we've been able, and it really gives that high level understanding of kind of just where some certain indicators are in the community. So we looked at that. Then kind of based on some of those findings, we developed a survey. And so what we wanted to do was really get the voice of individuals. And I think United Way in the past has done a super great job of understanding our donors and their voice and what they want to invest. But we really wanted this to be comprehensive. We wanted everyone to have a voice because this is everyone's community. Um, and we wanted, we wanted to people, to, everyone to, be able to kind of bring to the, the top what those issues were. Um, so we were actually able to use our partner organizations and all five of our counties, um, specifically in Lynn County and, and Cedar Rapids, we were able to partner with um, uh, Lynn County as well as the city of Cedar Rapids to get the survey distributed. So that was like one fun fact that uh, instead of having to fill out three surveys from three separate entities, you got to do one. So that was just a really great collaboration to be able to do that. And then what we found out from that survey is that we have a abundance of middle-aged white women that respond to surveys. So we were really missing a lot of key demographics in voice. And so we worked again in collaboration because um, Lane County Public Health also did a similar, a, a few months later, they Kind of went on their own and were doing their own um, survey process and uh, got the same results. And so what we decided to do was go ahead and partner uh, and do some targeted focus groups. And I can tell you what we what we found was through all three points of those, it, it was the same conclusion, which is very, very interesting. Awesome. Well, the one thing that I think about is when you look at who is the person who is taking those surveys for us to be able to pivot a little bit and say, wait a minute, we want to make sure every voice is heard. I think that's really important to, to be able to allow people the ability to voice what's happening. I think we definitely, we learned, and then we've learned that we have more work to do. Like we were able to do some focus groups, but we definitely um, have many other voices that we want to be able to amplify and be able to give um, context and, and, and um, feedback as well. Yeah. Okay, so what did you learn from a, about our community from the community impact assessment? 
Okay, so shocker, everybody, housing came on number one. Um, however, what we, and this is, um, housing came in, affordable housing was number one. However, through some interesting um, further discussions in the community, safe housing came up as well. And so when we talk about housing too, where we, it's the affordability, but it's also safe. You know, we have houses that are still in flux after um, derecho. And we do have, you know, Patch, we have a great program that's been willing to um, work um, um, with homeowners to be able to do that. But we had reduced housing stock, derecho hit, we reduced it anymore. So that kind of came front and um, center for us. Second was childcare. Again, should not be a shocker for everyone. I do think that the child care one is an issue that rang true across the board for most individuals because you can be any household with a child and have been affected by child care's closing in our community, um, lack of spots available, um, the COVID disruption, and just uh, a lot of turnover and um, not having the workforce to be able to um, keep a lot of those child cares open. And the third uh, that came true, I'm going to say number three and number four were so close. I feel like I have to mention both of those. Number three was the safety net services. So to me, those are the services that um, they're the crisis services. They're the access. Do you have access to food? Is it the shelter? Is it, it could be transportation. So if something interrupts your, your life, do you have the ability to access a service provision, whatever it may be to kind of help you bounce back? Um, so that was number three. And then close was the access to healthcare, specifically mental health. Um, and again, that's not a surprise because we know that um, two years into a pandemic and then another disaster has just been, it's been hard uh, for people. Um, so I think that um, across the board, again, none of these are shocking. However, um, they definitely, um, I guess I should say what was should not be shocking, but as we dug in, uh, we wanted to not just look at this data and look at these top concerns. We also wanted to understand it from an, from an equity standpoint. And so as we started to dig into these top issues and looking more specifically at that data, we really saw, saw some gaps. And uh, we saw gaps, if you look at um, women versus um, men earnings. We saw gaps that um, single parent versus um, not single parents. But I think most concerning and where we saw where we need to have the most impact is just the, 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 the different racial impacts on some of our data. I was just going to say, and you actually started to go there on your own a little bit, was if you look across the board with those top four things, I, I think the pandemic and the derecho were, um, they didn't care who you were, right? And so it was a very hard hit, affordable housing, when it comes to child care, when it comes to mental health, those are things that they affect a vast majority, if not all of our society. Crisis services is a little different, but then what I think is really fascinating is, is, as you just started to allude to, you start to peel back the layers a little bit, and then that's when you really start to see the discrepancies. So on one level, everything, it's affecting almost everybody in our community, but then you look and it goes deeper and it's really affecting subsets of our community in different ways. Yeah, I think what was very eye-opening for me personally was our focus groups where we were able, you know, data is data, but when you start talking about a, a lived experience um, and, and, and being able to start to understand and be educated on a lot of the disparities in the community, a lot of the systemic issues that our, our community is facing, I think that's that's where we have found that we need to really ensure that we are making our investments um, strategically to address those areas. Yeah. Is that what you would consider like the surprising piece or were there other pieces that were surprising to you and members of your team? You know, I don't think it, 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 there is, it should not be surprising. I think we, I think there's a level of knowing. I think it's a level of educating and communicating and the lack um, of that being communicated, you know, 
I just look at the, the one stat that always stands out to me is just if you look at household income by race, and there's over a $30,000 gap between white households and African American households. And that to me is just, that is a staggering number. Um, and I think the shocking thing is, wow, how have we not been able to still address that in our community? How are we okay continuing with that in our community? Because that stat is for Lynn County. That's not a nationwide stat. It's not a stat across Iowa. It is our stat. Correct. Correct. Yep. Okay, so what are the next steps for the community impact assessment? So our next steps is, you know, what, what we wanted to do with all of this information is to really build our build better solutions. So understanding it, like you kind of said, digging deep and, and doing those layers, what's it going to take to be able to start making some actual progress on this? And the one thing that I know going into this and we have definitely learned is we, we can't do it by ourselves. Nobody can do it by ourselves. So I think our next steps for us, there's, there's kind of two. There's a internally within United Way, where do we hope to go with this information? And then I think as a community, there's another approach. And I think internally, one of our key pieces is that we have the luxury of, of time and being able to build a, um, a, a better RFP process to target investment priorities that we have kind of identified that this is where we need to strategically place our investments. And that's, you know, that's our um, donations, that's our time, that's our advocacy efforts, all of those things. And they really need to align. We need to have really clear messaging on exactly what we're doing um, and, and how others can do things. Because again, it's it's the community as a whole. You know, I, I don't want to look to nonprofits to solve this. This is a this is a community-wide issue and we all kind of have to um, understand and be willing to, to put our, raise our hand and kind of um, help along the way. So I think internally, those are that's our big next step is really making sure we have a, a good investment process and we have the right organizations and individuals um, and just continue to address those. I think externally, it's alignment of all those people, all the organizations to be able to agree upon what is the best strategy and how do we go forward. And what I'm really excited about is when we're addressing specifically housing in Lane County, there's a great group that's already meeting and strategically talking about that. You know, we just had the regional visioning yesterday and two of our top priorities, um, housing and childcare were addressed there um, as well. So we know that this is a regional issue that I'm hoping we'll be able to work together to do. Um, the other thing I think that we really need to help people understand is we're going to talk about our community impact assessment results, um, but it's not just clear we are not going to probably invest all of our financial assets into housing because there's there's more things that go into housing. There could be housing subtext that needs to be addressed, but really we also want to create that economic mobility. We want individuals to be able to feel like they can afford or they should be able to have a livable wage and be able to afford housing. And what's that going to take? And how do we how do we help educate homeowners that didn't really know the process to become a homeowner? Um, how do we help individuals take the next step in um, building their own skill set and being able to get to where they want, you know, and it's going to start all the way back in with our kids and how are we setting that stage for them to be able to um, create opportunity and believe that they can, everyone can achieve what they want to. I think that's one of the key learning lessons for me personally, as we've dug into this, particularly around affordable housing, and, and you've helped educate me on this, Carrie, when we originally said affordable housing, and it was Gosh, that might have been last summer when you were like, well, this is kind of one of the number one topics that we're starting to see bubble up, but we'll wait and see. I just immediately thought housing stock. I thought immediately just the building itself. And mm -hmm. as we've started to dig into it and you've started to explain more, there is so much more to it. And I think that's the key piece that you just said is 
we can't solve this alone. There's no one entity in our community that's going to be able to solve affordable housing or solve childcare. It's going to take all of us coming together in different ways, but making sure that it is um, not constructed, but being able to make sure that we're all focusing on that path to be able to greater prosperity for everyone, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's great about the community impact assessment is it's everyone speaking, and what it does is all of a sudden, even though we're all saying the same thing, it's like, yeah, we got data. We've got data that we're all aligned moving to the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So how has this process shaped the way you view your role at United Way and our role in the community? Oh, this was not a question I was prepared <laughs> for, Kristen Roberts. All <laughs> right. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I look at... I look at what I originally had envisioned in my mind, what this community impact assessment process was going to look like. And it was, um, we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this. And it was one of those things that along every single part, if you look, there's always a way to convene, there's a way to collaborate, there's a way that, you know, we just can all work together. And that's one of the, the things that I have enjoyed the most is just building relationships in the community and helping people, um, you know, oh, you're talking about this. You need to talk to this person. We need to get together and really address this. And, and just being able to support. I, I, am not the, I am not the pro when it comes to any single one of these issues, but I know who is. <laughs> and I will get them around the table. And, you know, it's, it's okay if we can't come up with the answer right away. And it's okay if we, if we fail sometimes, but we've got to start taking the steps um, together in the right process. So I think that's been a really interesting. And I think just going through this, things have fallen into place where it's been very, it's been very interesting. And so it's been able, it's been easy to look at the community impact assessment as one thing, but then if I align that with our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and what has come out of there and how the, the two are so in sync and have to, you have to balance that and you have to address both issues um, to have any progress. And I look at some of the things that we're doing um, in just educating ourselves and helping, you know, convene and, and give education where we can. I just think that that has been a wonderful opportunity for our growth and then being able to share those experiences as well. Well, and it could be a whole different convos with Kristen topic with diversity, equity, and inclusion, but right. it makes me think about how as an organization, we said, do we want to single it out or do we want to make sure instead that it's weaved in through everything, particularly around our strategic plan? And we decided to weave it in. And this is a prime example of how that is just beautifully playing out because once it's woven in, then we're going to be able to make real, true, deep work movement on it. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so we have obviously people on this phone call who are supporters of United Way. They are people who are game changers. They're the hand raisers. They're all of those terms that we like to use and they like to get involved in the community. So if someone on the call is interested in getting involved with addressing our community's needs, how can they do that? What advice do you have for them? Sure. So um, it's really easy because we've got three different ways that we kind of uh, steer people in our community. The first is give. So being able to continue to provide the, the resources for our nonprofits to be able to do this work. That has been, that has been really, um, and I've worked nonprofits my entire career, so I understand the challenges. Uh, but if I specifically look at how our nonprofits have risen to the challenges that we've faced in the last two years, I, can, I cannot see a better investment in um, organizations that are helping people than just right here in our community. It's, um, and they're the ones that are on the front line doing the work. I mean, I, if you even look at Geneva Tower and the fire and seeing the multiple nonprofits that were there in response and just, and, and I'm talking CEOs were there. I, you know, Mike Barnhart from Horizons was there driving the bus. It, it really is eye-opening. And I, 
I just think that that's something to celebrate in our community. So being able to give enables those organizations to continue their work. And I think giving through United Way really helps because we've done that work now, we've done that community impact assessment, we really know where the need is and where we need to invest. Second is just advocating. And so we really are learning advo advocating ourselves and how to advocate. And that really could just be as simple as learning about what we found about in our community impact assessment and learning about some of the things that have come up. I know one of the things that we plan on doing as a staff is going to the redlining exhibit at the African American Museum because that is something that has come up multiple times in conversations and we really need to understand that because it is something that is very important that we do understand and address. So learning, understanding, educating yourself. Um, I think, you know, we're, we don't, we don't need, we're not asking people to like go to the hill and advocate in that level. Um, certainly feel free as we start to align our, our um, priorities with what um, could match that, but it, it, it's, there's a wide range on how you can advocate for people in your community. And the third is just really volunteering. You know, there's, there's a lot of great ways that you can volunteer through United Way, um, as well as with United Way. And so I just look at the support that when you volunteer, you're supporting each other, you're supporting our nonprofits, you're supporting yourself, really. Um, it's just, a, it's great all around for people. And a little sneak peek when you were talking about that educating piece, can you give just a little insight into what our website will hopefully be able to do and what you're working yes. on? So I just got the first glimpse at it today and we're really excited. We've historically in the past, we've done, United Way has been always great about understanding the data. Um, however, it's been um, through, definitely through like papers, white papers, white pages, those kinds of things. And so it can be so dense to get through. And so um, what we decided, well, one, because I don't wanna wade through tons of papers to get to a, a key data point I want, um, and I know there's a lot of nonprofits that look to United Way and ask for those certain key demographics, and it's just a time saver to have them somewhere. So what we are doing is an interactive um, data uh, web, web page, basically. And so what, we're, what we'll be able to do is look at a lot of the key um, indicators under housing, under um, financial, economic, education, health, and then just general population indicators to be able for our nonprofits or individuals to use. We'll also be able to, um, you'll be able to sort by county. So uh, we are a five county United Way. We wanna make sure that we're focusing on all five of our counties. So I'm, I am really excited about this. I think it's something that we have needed. All right, and that ties in directly to the next question that just popped into the chat. So what is the next step in getting others outside of Lynn County involved? Sure. So we, um, it's hard. I am not going to lie. That's the, trying to um, engage our other counties is, has been kind of starting from scratch. Um, there's not the trust built in a lot of the communities. Um, there's not the engagement, there's not exposure. And so one of the first things that we have done is um, we had the opportunity to apply for an RSVP grant, which is works with um, volunteers 55 and better as I am, as I have learned. Um, and it's the, it, it really, what we've been able to do is we have had them in Lynn County uh, and Jones County, but we were able to expand into Cedar and, and uh, Benton County. And the key thing with those three areas, especially Benton, Cedar, um, and um, Jones. I'm blanking in my, thank you, Jones, <laughs> um, is that those people that our staff that we've hired for those positions live in the county. So they're from there. They know, um, they know people, they know how to engage. And so really the first step that we're taking is just building relationships, knowing and understanding what the community needs, understanding who so some of those, um, I look at them as like as the change champions of the county. Um, in starting to align and just build relationships with them. And I think we have really made some um, great progress in Benton County. 
Um, I think we're starting to, Jones has always been, um, we, we've been able to do well in Jones and then Cedar, we're starting to. Iowa County, we have some work to do. We don't have a staff that's located there. Uh, we've built some partnerships with Williamsburg School District and um, specifically working with their migrant community. So we always just look for little opportunities where we can uplift um, and just continue to educate ourselves and build those relationships. Yeah, it, it's definite work. It's not going to happen overnight. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Another question has come in. How are we working with our partner agencies to ensure everyone is working collaboratively? Sure. So I think the best way, um, it's, it's hard. First of all, I think there are key areas that um, already work really well together. And I honestly, um, there's probably a lot of input and ways that go into that, that even I, I don't even completely understand. But when we look specifically at housing, um, that's the easiest. We, we should be very, very proud that we have a continuum of care, um, which is uh, one, and the access to housing is kind of a one stop. So you call Waypoint and you're able to then be linked to all of our homeless shelters in our area. Uh, we were able in the last year and a half to take that up a notch and include rent and utility assistance as well. So if you have any housing needs that you can call this, um, you can call Waypoint as the one point of entry and they're able to collaboratively, they work together to address this. This is a model that we have really seen take off and emerge and, and there's hiccups, don't get me wrong, but it, it really is working. And I see this as well as with our ongoing housing needs. Um, the patch, um, providing assistance to community homeowners, which was in response to derecho is another community collaboration where you have 10 different organizations that are, are working together. Um, I look at Opportunity Center, I look at Reading into Success. Those have been two areas that we have been um, uh, going in and quality improving because what we need is you need to have that issue and then you need to have the buy-in, but you also need to encourage partners. And you know, this was the, the main thing with our rent utility assistance is you're not losing your identity as your organization. You still are doing what you are doing because you're the best at doing what you do, but we need to work together on that. So I do think that um, where our place has been in every single one of those was the convening part. I, I look at that and just being able to go in and bring people to the table and just kind of ask, what can we do? What if? Um, so sometimes I think it's just luck of the draw and timing. And sometimes I'm like, I think we've worked really hard to be able to do that. So I, I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it is happening. The one thing it reminds me of when you're talking was recently we were in a situation where someone asked you, oh, well, who's who's in charge of the patch program? And your answer was wonderful. You said, well, actually, that's kind of hard to answer because there's 10 plus organizations who are part of it and they're all doing their thing and they're all in charge of it, so to speak. And it was just such a great illustration of the collaboration piece that you're talking about. And I'll for, never forget the person was like, oh, OK, you could tell that it was just this new new thought process for, for that to happen. The other piece too that it makes me think about is duplication of services. That's another question that we get a lot of when it comes to duplication of services. Do we feel as if the community impact assessment in any way has any um, uh, overview of duplication of services or when it comes to that topic, what are your thoughts on that? Mm, I think that can be a hard one for me. I can see it. I, can, I, I see two different ways to look at that. I look at it from a funder and understand when you have limited resources to invest, you want, you want the organization that's doing the best and you're going to go with that organization. And so I think duplication of services comes into play because you want, you, you want the most effective solution and the most effective organization to be able to do that. Um, I can also see from, if you're talking about having only one organization though that does the one thing. I, I don't know how that comes into play. I think we have multiple organizations that, that do maybe the same service delivery, 
but I also think that there is option for choice um, in that way. I mean, I, I just look at, if you look at nonprofits that provide mental health services, um, I have a hard time saying duplication of services is, is, a, is you know, a, a thing to address because um, organizations are different. And you, as someone who is going to a therapy session or trying to engage with the therapy, a therapist may need to go to multiple organizations to find that right fit. So I do think that there's kind of, that's not giving you a great answer on that, that's but fine. it's, yeah. it's kind of a hard question, I think. Um, and you have to look at both perspectives, mm -hmm. um, and understand where, um, probably what the, what the, the primary need is you're trying to address and then kind of work from there. No, that's great. Okay, another question has come in. How is United Way Worldwide assisting us with local goals and achievements? So the one thing that really comes to mind, first of all, is that United Way Worldwide um, has made some um, diversity, equity, and inclusion standards that um, we as United Ways need to meet. Um, and um, Kristen can actually talk to probably the top two of those, but the third one is specifically to our investment process and strategy. And, and that was being able to look at what does the data say? Where are we looking at? Um, how are we looking at disparities that we see in, in data? And how are we um, effectively um, moving to ensure that we are aligning our priorities and our investments with those disparities. Also looking at, I think we are very comfortable investing in the tried and true. Mm -hmm. um, and we, this really opened um, our eyes and some of their guidance that we need to look to some of those grassroots, newer um, nonprofits that are in our community. And um, we need to offer the support to them to grow into the tried and true um, and not just make that um, an indicator that is immediately brushed aside. So um, that's one thing that I can think of is that they, you know, I, I say that they're, they're requiring it, but it's something that I think we would, even if they didn't, that's, a, that's, that's the path we would choose anyhow, but they've been able to offer some guidance and support around that. I also feel as if around advocacy that United Way Worldwide does a really nice job of being able to connect us with our local representatives. Obviously, we have those connections as well. But in the since my time here, it sounds as if before pre-COVID, there was a day on the hill when United Way would fly to Washington, D.C., and we would advocate on certain things. And obviously, we haven't done that over the past couple of years. And they still do a day on the hill that's virtual. But then there's also these other opportunities in which United Way Worldwide is focusing on these uh, priorities within health, education, financial stability. Some do match up particularly with different areas. Others may or may not. Childcare may be one. Um, but then they are really helping focus and uh, tailor our messages when it comes to our representatives and giving us the opportunity to sign on to bills or sign on to different ways to show our support for certain bills. So I think that's another way in which United Way Worldwide helps us. And then I would also pull in United Ways of Iowa. We're a part of United Ways of Iowa in which they truly do provide a lot of support for us around advocacy at the state level as well. And um, those are just great partnerships that we're able to get support from as well. And the network, just the network, the network. to be yeah. able to understand yeah. what other United Ways have gone through, what their, what their, you know, trials and tribulations and being able to, I think that's, it, that's just a great value add. Mm -hmm. I would agree. All right, these questions from the audience have been wonderful. Looking to see if there are any more. Do you have any final thoughts, Carrie, or things we haven't talked about at this point that you want to add in? You know, I just, um, I think the thing that rings true to me is that um, the community impact assessment focused very, I mean, it really focused, uh, focused on what are the things that aren't going right? <laughs> yeah. So where are we yeah. lacking? Kind yeah. of that, and I think what has really come out of it, though, is there are so many things that are that we are doing well. How do we take those and build off of those? How do we? Um, 
how do we, I don't know. I, I think sometimes it's, um, sometimes I think we set ourselves up to fail by having these big, big um, goals that we want to be able to, and this just isn't United Way. This is in talking with a lot of different organizations. You know, we're going to eliminate homelessness. Yeah. Well, are we ever going to, I mean, that would be wonderful, but really we need to look at the steps that we have taken and, and, and celebrate some of the, the incremental successes. And so um, I think, the, yeah, I guess I, you know, it starts, it started out as deficiency and I think it's just building us up as, as being a stronger community. And what I hear you say is it came out as the deficiencies, but then we were able to start looking into what's already being done, how we can continue to process and prove that. And that's where it's like, hey, we might be further along on some of these things than what we originally thought. Yep, I think so. And I think that there's some things that we have a long way to go on, but, <laughs> but I think that's the work that was done to be able to start to understand what some of those areas are. All right. Well, that gave a couple extra minutes for people to put another question into the chat and I don't see any other questions coming in. So I'm wondering if maybe we might be done. Thank you, Carrie, just for your time and insight today. Um, I think a big thank you to for you and all the work that you and your team has done in 2021. That was a pretty heavy lift. And obviously there was a lot other things going on with a pandemic and still clean up from derecho and everything. So you and your team have done a lot of work. So just thank you from obviously us at United Way, but the community too. I think there's going to be some real impact that this community impact assessment is going to move forward for us, for our community. So thank Great. you. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. We always appreciate being able to get a little deeper dive into what we do here at United Way for you, for, uh, for you and from us. Um, on the horizons, we alluded to it a little bit with Carrie, uh, results from the community impact are starting to be used to frame some community-driven strategy that will really just address those needs that we talked about today around housing, childcare, childhood success, Faith, you know, net, uh, safety net services, access to mental health. So stay tuned. We're starting to work through that. And probably in about a month or two, late April, early May, you'll probably start to hear mid-May, you'll start to hear about some more things as to how United Way is taking this information and just moving it along in our work. So as always, our marketing people always want me to say, please stay tuned with us on social media and our website at uweci.org. That's the best way to connect with us. Or most of you have my email or Carrie's email. We are available on the internet. So feel free to shoot us a message. We're always happy to continue the conversation. All right. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate your time today. Have a great day. Enjoy the warm weather.